of certain packaging of ready-to-eat produce known as modified atmosphere packaging, the bags of ready-to-eat greens. CALGMA does not require an enforceable standard of cold chain of distribution. It does not impose tough requirements on packagers and distributors relating to the best consumed by date that's stamped on the ready-to-eat packaging. People have seen those. So they don't have any tough requirements on those packagers and distributors. Put that stamp on there. Now, scientists tell us that if bagged produce labeled as ready-to-eat is not constantly refrigerated through the distribution chain, it quickly becomes a perfect habitat for bacterial growth. Harmful bacteria, such as E. coli 157, multiply unseen and undetectable to the eye of the consumer. Legions of pathogens can thereby invade the unsuspecting consumer's intestinal tract, overwhelming his or her immune system, causing severe and painful complications, and in some cases, death. Everyone who has experienced severe food poisoning knows what's at stake. While it's largely silent on key questions applying to upstream processing and distribution of ready-to-eat produce, CALGMA has a lot to say about farming practices and land stewardship. Small and organic farmers in particular have expressed concern about the costs and the scientific justification for some of CALGMA's requirements. Some of CALGMA's metrics are seen to be in direct conflict with environmental protection and widely accepted agricultural practices. In some cases, streams have been contaminated, wildlife refuge destroyed, biodiversity threatened by farmers' efforts to remain in compliance with CALGMA. Today we hope to address why CALGMA's regulatory framework has focused solely on farming practices to the exclusion of the rest of the supply chain. It seems the farmers have taken the brunt of the burden of minimizing contamination when it may make more scientific sense to focus attention on the processing, packaging, and distribution of ready-to-eat produce. Consumers have a right to expect that the food they eat is safe. It's in the public health interest that Americans consume greater amounts of raw vegetables. But whether or not nationalizing CALGMA, as the USDA has proposed, is the best way to achieve those goals is a question of uh, this hearing. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today on this important issue. And at this time, I recognize the uh, Honorable Congressman Jordan, ranking member of the committee from the state of Ohio. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing to examine the impact of leafy green marketing agreements. Most importantly, we need to have food supply that is safe. Americans should be able to feel confident that the produce they buy at the grocery store or that is served to them at restaurants will not make them sick. Leafy green marketing agreements such as CALGMA may be a, an effective way to ensure safer produce. However, additional guidelines and regulations may be overly burdensome to some farmers, especially small or family-owned and run farms. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their experience with uh, the marketing agreements. The FDA and USDA also play key roles in food safety and agriculture marketing. And I'm interested to hear how these roles may change if a, if a Leafy Greens marketing agreement is made national. Additionally, I hope that our witnesses can discuss the implications of H.R. 2749, Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009, which is scheduled to be voted on uh, yesterday and, and, and may, in fact, be voted on later today. Um, so I look forward to hearing how uh, your, your thoughts on, on that legislation as well. And I also look forward to examining the pros and cons of making, a national, making national the CALGMA uh, 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 agreement, and thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify here in front of the committee today. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. If there, uh, does the gentlelady from California have an opening statement? I do, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you so much 
for holding today's hearing to examine the leafy greens market, the role of private industry and government in regulating these products, and the economic, environmental, and food safety impacts of the California Leafy Greens Market Agreement. The hearing is happening at a very opportune time, and since 2003, um, pre-cut bagged lettuce has developed into the second fastest growth industry in the United States grocery sales. And you know, I'm from California. We believe in salads. And so making it critically important that adequate precautions are taken and analysis conducted to endure that this increasingly popular food is not just nutritious, but safe. And we've taken steps, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the state of uh, California to regulate the sale of not only the leafy greens package, but those in the bins as well. 98.5% uh, of the E. coli outbreaks reported in leafy greens have been associated with bagged and pre-cut greens. Now the infamous 2006 spinach outbreak resulted in over 200 hospitalizations, nearly $400 million in lost product, and three deaths confirmed by the FDA. In response to this and other similar instances, industry leaders developed the California Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement <coughs> to allow growers to join a voluntary regulatory framework which now encompasses 99% of California's leafy green business and is being considered for official nationalization. And I chaired those uh, committee meetings, Mr. Chairman, when I was um, chairperson of Health and Human Services. The um, CALGMA, CALMA, includes a food safety inspection program conducted by the USDA and the enforcement of metrics or regulations developed by scientists, governmental officials, growers, uh, processors, and businesses to reduce microbial contamination of leafy greens in the field to fork supply chain. While I'm pleased that the farming industry has taken the initiative to create this comprehensive framework for food safety, I believe it's important to scrutinize its effectiveness and its impact on the environment. Some have argued that the rules placed on farmers by CalGAM conflict with the movement towards organic and biological diverse farming methods and could be actually harming the environment. Furthermore, it may prove to be uh, a counterintuitive to create such regulations before, that is, there is conclusive scientific knowledge about how E. coli makes its way into the leafy green supply. So I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to make this presentation. I'm sorry I cannot stay. They just called an emergency meeting of the Progressive Caucus to discuss uh, the health care reform bill, and it's at 2.30. I just wanted you to know that. But I have staff here, and I will uh, be uh, hearing from them as to the witnesses in their testimony. So thank you so much. I yield back. I, I thank the gentlelady, and I'm sure she'll convey my sentiments in that uh, meeting of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, you can let them know that I'm uh, given the responsibility of chairing this hearing. Thank you for being here with that opening statement. If there's no additional opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I want to start by introducing our first panel. Mr. Mr. Michael, Michael R. Taylor is the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of Food and Drugs at the Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Mr. Taylor previously served as Deputy Commissioner for Policy and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Environmental Decision Making under in Uncertainty. He's held numerous positions in the field of food safety and research, among them Administrator of the Food Safety and Inspection Services at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Vice President for Public Policy at Monsanto Corporation. He's a, he was also a practicing attorney in the field at the law firm of King and Spaulding. Ms. Rain Pegg is the Administrator of the Agriculture 
Marketing Services, AMS, the marketing and regulatory arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome, Ms. Pegg. Prior to being appointed administrator at AMS, Ms. Pegg was Deputy Secretary of Legislation and Policy for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. She's also served as Director of International Trade and Plant Health for the California Farm Bureau, uh, Federation's National Affairs and Research Division, and as a Director of Governmental Relations to the Agricultural Council of California. Thanks for appearing before our subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. So I would ask that you rise and uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony. And to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, I want you to know that your entire statement and anything else you want to append to it will be included in the hearing record. Mr. Taylor, you will be our first witness. and. Uh, you may proceed. Five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich and uh, Mr. Jordan. I am Michael Taylor, Senior Advisor to the Commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, which, as you know, is part of the Department <clears throat> of Health and Human Services. I am pleased to be with you today to discuss issues related to the safety of fresh produce. As you know, FDA is the federal agency that is responsible for regulating most of the food supply except for meat, poultry, and processed egg products, which are overseen uh, by our partners at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. FDA is committed to ensuring that the U.S. food supply continues to be among the safest in the world. President Obama has made a personal commitment to improving food safety. On July 7th this year, the, the multi-agency food safety working group that the president established issued its key findings on how to upgrade the food safety system for the 21st century. The working group recommends a new public health focused approach to food safety based on three core principles, prioritizing prevention, strengthening surveillance and enforcement, and improving response and recovery. The FDA has been an integral part of the working group's continuing efforts to establish uh, these principles. Fresh produce, the topic of today's hearing, presents special uh, safety challenges, as the chairman outlined, and the number of illnesses associated with fresh produce is a continuing concern uh, for FDA. The increased consumption of produce in its fresh or raw form, including ready-to-eat bag products, reflects growing consumer interest in healthy eating, as you indicated, which is, of course, a desirable trend from a public health standpoint. But these new consumption patterns and products challenge our food safety efforts. Fresh produce has the potential to be a source of foodborne illness because it, it is consumed raw or with only minimal uh, processing and without, generally, interventions that would eliminate uh, any pathogens that may be present. Because most produce is grown in an outdoor environment, it is susceptible to contamination from pathogens present in the soil, in manure used as fertilizer due to the presence of animals in or near fields or packing areas, or in agricultural water or water used for uh, washing or cooling. Produce also may be vulnerable to contamination due to inadequate worker health and hygiene protections, environmental conditions, inadequate production safeguards, or inadequate sanitation of equipment and facilities. Fresh produce is produced on tens of thousands of farms, and contamination at any one step in the growing packing and processing chain can be amplified throughout the subsequent steps. But we also know that the possibility of harmful contamination can be minimized by understanding these potential entry points for pathogens and by implementing preventive measures wherever possible throughout the system. Thus, in keeping with the Obama administration's prevention-oriented food safety strategy, FDA intends to improve safety uh, of fresh produce by establishing enforceable standards for the implementation of science-based preventive controls throughout the chain of production, processing, and distribution. These regulations will capitalize on what we in the produce industry have learned over the past decades since we published our Good Agricultural Practices Guidances uh, in 1998, and they will tap the best science to develop appropriate criteria or metrics for ensuring the, the effectiveness of preventive controls, in particular, in particular production and processing settings. 
In the short term, FDA will issue commodity-specific guidances for industry on the measures they can implement now to prevent or minimize microbial hazards of, of fresh produce. FDA will soon uh, publish draft guidances for improving the safety of leafy greens, melons, and tomatoes, three specific commodities that have been associated with foodborne illness outbreaks. The guidances describe preventive controls that industry can implement to reduce the risk of microbial contamination in the growing, harvesting, transporting, and distribution of these commodities. It is not enough, of course, to issue regulations and guidances. We must also ensure that the preventive measures they call for are widely and effectively implemented. To that end, FDA will work with its federal and state partners to plan and implement an inspection and enforcement program, program aimed at ensuring high rates of compliance with the produce safety regulations. FDA recognizes the importance of leveraging the expertise and resources of other federal, state, and local agencies to be sure the industry understands the new requirements and to help them achieve greater compliance. One way we can leverage resources is to work with the Agricultural Marketing Service as they consider and implement marketing agreements and orders. By incorporating FDA standards and voluntary marketing agreements and then conducting audits to ensure compliance by those who subscribe to such agreements, AMS contributes to the goal we all share, which is widespread compliance with modern preventive control measures. We believe that AMS, by incorporating FDA's produce safety standards and marketing agreements or orders, can help ensure high rates of compliance with FDA standards. In addition to highlighting measures that the executive branch could implement to enhance food safety, the White House Food Safety Working Group also noted the need for Congress to modernize the food safety statutes. Legislative authorities for FDA that would enhance the safety of products include enhanced ability to require science-based preventive controls, enhanced ability to establish and enforce performance standards to measure the implementation of proper food safety procedures, access to basic food safety records, a new inspection mandate, uh, and other tools to foster compliance and other provisions. The Food Safety Enhancement Act, H.R. 2749, being considered by the House today, it, it addresses these needs, and the Obama administration strongly supports its passage. Well, thank you again for the chance to be here, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Begg, you may proceed. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation for me to appear here before you today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a brief overview of our act activities regarding marketing orders and agreements for fruits and vegetables. As Mr. Taylor stated, FDA is the federal agency responsible for food safety of fruits and vegetables. At USDA, the Food Safety and Inspection Service holds similar responsibility for meat, poultry, and egg products. The mission of AMS is to facilitate the marketing of agricultural products. AMS is not a food safety agency. We are an agency with a long history of working with producers and processors on marketing programs that in involve inspection of product, product quality and verification production processes. Under the Agricultural Marketing Agreement Act of 1937, marketing orders and agreements assist farmers and handlers by allowing them to collectively work to solve marketing problems. These pro programs are industry initiated and subject to pub public review. There is a seven-step process in initiating a marketing agreement. The industry petitions yes, USDA, which recently occurred on the National Leafy Green Marketing Agreement. USDA, USDA holds public meetings, which we will be having on the National Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement in September and October. We review all comments and either terminate the proceedings or publish a proposed rule. In the past, we have terminated proceedings of a potential marketing agreement or order. USDA publishes a final agreement and appoints a committee. The committee develops best practices. Those best practices are sent out, are published for public comment, and then USDA publishes a final metrics or best practices. Marketing agreements only apply, apply to handlers who voluntarily sign an agreement. Fees are collected from handlers to cover local costs of administering these programs. The Act provides authority to regulate the quality of commodities through federal agreements. USDA considers the harmful pathogens of toxins to be a characteristic of higher quality products. Federal marketing orders and agreements include minimum quality grade requirements, which can identify with the presence of mold, insect infestation, foreign material, or other contaminants. The marketing order for California prunes has an inspection and fumigation requirements relative to live insect infestations since 1961. Since 1977, California raisins 
have required the absence of dirt, insects, and mold. And beginning in 2005, pistachio handlers were required to test all nuts destined for human consumption for aflatoxin, which if present, if present would, be lower, would lower the quality and market value of pistachios. On June 8th, AMS received an industry proposal for a national marketing agreement for lettuce, spinach, spinach and other leafy greens. The purpose of the proposed agreement is to enhance the quality and increase the marketability of fresh, leafy, green vegetable products through the application of good agricultural and handling practices. Requirements implemented under the proposed program would be science-based, conform to FDA guidance to minimize food safety risks, and be subject to USDA oversight. The program would only be binding on signatory handlers. The program would require signatories to verify that any product handled comes from producers or handlers using verified good agricultural and handling practices. The program would authorize unannounced audits and apply to imports. Any product deemed an immediate food safety risk concerned by USDA inspection would be reported to FDA. We are aware that there are concerns from various groups on the proposed marketing agreement. We welcome comments from those parties and other interested parties and will carefully consider them. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reiterate that the federal food safety policies for fruits and vegetables fall under the jurisdiction of FDA. However, AMS does have significant experience in the design and delivery of marketing programs, including marketing orders and agreements. The process for potentially establishing a marketing order or agreement is an open and transparent process in which AMS carefully considers all viewpoints. I'm happy to respond to any questions. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, we will now proceed with 10 minutes of questions, uh, beginning with myself, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Jordan. I'd like to start with Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, ready to eat is a marketing slogan assuring that the salad in the package is safe for consumption without requiring further washing or cutting by the consumer. The California Leafy Greens Handler Marketing Agreement, CALGMA, is a voluntary industry-sponsored means of ensuring quality and safety of processed leafy greens, including those to be marketed as ready to eat. It was developed to preempt legislative regulatory action from the California State Assembly. Has CALGMA made pre-cut salads safer than they were before? And if yes, what's the basis for that opinion? Well, the, Mr. Chairman, the, the practices, uh, producer practices embodied in that agreement, if implemented, make a contribution to making the food safer. I think we all understand that the, the safety of the product ultimately depends on what happens not only at that point on the, on the production end, but through processing and the way the product is handled throughout. When you say uh, contribution, what do you mean? Well, the, it, and is there sci the, what's the science behind that? The, the safety of, the, of these products in the end depends on preventing contamination. The, they're, Pull that they're, mic a little closer, will you, sir? Sorry. Thanks. The, the, the safety of these products really depends uh, fundamentally on prevention of contamination in the first place. Uh, for a, a raw, uh, a fresh product, we don't have processing steps that decisively kill pathogens. So prevention throughout the system is the key to safety. And so the point is that the on-farm practices embodied in the agreement make a contribution. But, but isn't it true that uh, since Calgary went into effect, there's still been foodborne illnesses traced to the bag leafy lettuce produce? The, the, they're absolutely. They're the, the safety. Do you, do you remember some of them, the uh, Romaine, 2008 Romaine lettuce outbreak? Remember that? Yeah, I was not in the government then, but I'm aware of these outbreaks. You're aware of the iceberg yeah. lettuce outbreak also in that year? Yeah, I think. Well, isn't it true that in nearly every case since 1999, outbreaks of foodborne pathogens that were traced to leafy greens involved pre-cut packaged leafy greens, not whole leafy greens? Yeah. Mr. Taylor? Yeah, no, improving the safety of these products is a work in progress, Mr. Chairman. Let me just mention well, another wait, thing. You didn't answer my question, though. No. I mean, one of the things about being in, this, in front of this committee, it's a lot easier if you answer the question. You didn't answer the question. Please answer the question. If, if the question is whether the, the marketing agreement has solved the problem of fresh produce safety, no, the answer is no, of course it hasn't. Well, I, I, I asked you a question, though, you didn't answer. I'm going to repeat it just to make sure that you heard it. I asked you that isn't it true that in nearly every case since 1999, outbreaks of foodborne pathogens that were traced to leafy greens involved pre-cut packaged leafy greens, not whole leafy greens? Th yes or no? Yes. Thank you. 
Now, Mr. Taylor, doesn't that suggest that the processing of leafy greens is a significant factor, the processing is a significant factor in causing outbreaks of foodborne pathogens? There are features of that process that do create an environment for pathogen growth. You're Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, according to the CEO of CALGMA, the FDA reviewed the good agricultural practices and metrics imposed by CALGMA, and the USDA insists that its marketing agreement program is consistent with FDA guidelines and regulations. One thing we've noticed in our review of CALGMA is that a lot of requirements are imposed on farmers, while comparatively less burdensome guidance is suggested to the processors who buy the greens from the farmers and turn them into pre-cut packaged salads for marketing to the public. I mean, even when I look at your testimony, it's, you know, you're still pretty heavy on the farmer side. Now, for instance, when CALGMA prohibits farmers from planting within 400 feet of a hedgerow on the questionable basis that wildlife pose a significant risk of contamination, CALGMA allows the processing activity of coring lettuce in the field, an activity that the FDA acknowledges has a potential for contamination, with only minimal guidance for washing and storing of the knives used to core lettuce. Seems to be a double standard, Mr. Taylor. Is Calga's, Calgma's imposition of detailed requirements on farmers, but only suggested guidelines on handlers and distributors, justified by the science on how to make pre-cut salads safer? The science says we need enforceable preventive measures throughout the system from farm through distribution. And that's why the Food and Drug Administration is going to issue regulations that would do exactly that. The science says that, but what about CALGMA's uh, requirements on farmers as opposed to uh, guidance on handlers and distributors? But you're saying then that there's a, there's a gap. Is that you saying that? There's a lot of work to do to improve the safety of produce. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. In fact, doesn't the FDA's 2008 guidance for industry to minimize microbi uh, microbial food safety hazards for fresh cut foods and vegetables incorporate specific standards for processing, packaging, and transportation of leafy greens that CALGMA does not? Isn't that true? Y yes. Okay. They, yes. We're making progress. Now, Ms. Gray. <laughs> yes. I can't you know how many, tell you how many times farmers, especially small farmers, have told me that the USDA represents everybody but the farmers. Mm -hmm. Let's hope the new administration succeeds in changing that impression. In the next panel, we're going to hear from a farmer who has a lot of criticism of CALGMA. And we're going to hear from a survival, uh, survivor of E. coli poisoning related to pre-cut lettuce that she ate in 2008. As you know, USDA is actively promoting the nationalization of CALGMA. What is the USDA's position on CALGMA's apparent double standard? in that it prescribes specific, if not always scientifically supportable, requirements on farmers, while it condones questionable processing protocols that benefit the processing companies, such as coring lettuce in the field. We do not have a position on the current National Leafy Greens marketing proposal. That's before the public. It's at the very beginning of the process. The hearings will begin in September and October. Think? What do I? What do you think? What do I think? What do you think? I think at the end of the day, the program needs to work for small producers. It needs to work for different cultural practices, regional differences. I think at the end of the day, that's the only way you're going to have the best national program. At the end of the day, do you think the processing companies ought to have uh, protocols that are protective of the consumers? I processors, yes, should. Everyone has to play a part in food safety in Including the chain. Including processors, not just the farmers, processors as well? Yes, of course. Okay. Now, Ms. Pegg, if CALGMA becomes nationalized, there will likely be increased costs on growers, farmers, as they take mitigation measures to be in compliance with the CALGMA requirements. These costs will be both financial as well as environmental, such as costs of turning areas of land that might have been previously wild into empty lots and the associated land erosion, runoff, stream contamination that follows. With this in mind, do you believe that uh, the USDA should consider environmental impacts when promoting marketing agreements, regulating food production? Yes. We Thank must you. We must consider environmental impacts. We must, we must make sure that it's in compliance with state and federal laws. I think the other point that, point that you bring up is, Right now, what farmers are facing, and I just got an email last night from a farmer I know in California, is they're facing buyers are requiring good agricultural practices. And so even without the marketing agreement, you're seeing buyers demanding good agricultural practices of farmers. 
let's talk about a specific issue that would matter to the processors as opposed to the farmers. Isn't it true that the best, that best consumed by expiration date that's stamped is now 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant? Well, only seven years ago, the best consumed by date for fresh cut produce was more like five to 10 days. I actually have no knowledge of the best consumed date. I think that may be an FDA issue. So well, okay, you know, I let's go to Mr. Taylor then. Okay. Uh, she she <laughs> deferred to you. Now, Sorry. Uh, did, you get the, did you get the question? We're, we're our partners here, Mr. Chairman. I, I see that partnership. Now I want to find out well, how good of a partner you are. Can you answer the question? Those best consumed dates are really a company uh, measure. Those aren't an FDA requirement and they address uh, product quality. Okay, principally. well, you know, they're company measures, but uh, isn't it true that the best consumed date that was that stamped, yeah. right now it's about 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant, right? Is that right yeah, or not? I, I, don't, I don't personally have those facts at my disposal, Be but good I, to don't have them. I don't have any reason You're to. You're the guy, you got to have them. Yeah. It's 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant. But a few years ago, Mr. Jordan, the best consumed by date for fresh produce was more like five to 10 days. Now, you know, and I'd, I would ask you, Mr. Taylor, to take note of that. Because wouldn't it show you that you're, you're making, uh, um, a, you're closing a window here yeah. a little bit on, on issues of safety? Yeah. You're opening up the possibilities of contamination, right. especially if these well, bagged no, th leafy greens uh, become hot houses of contamination if there's not consistent refrigeration. But, and this is where, uh, again, preventive controls, science-based preventive controls are all about understanding issues just like that. What, what is the, the likelihood of growth? What are the conditions that would reduce growth? And what's a, an acceptable holding period uh, for products? So in doing our preventive control regulations, that's the kind of issue that we'll need to address. Okay, one final question, and we're going to go over to uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Ms. Pegg, mm -hmm. CALGMA is silent <clears throat> on the selection of best consumed by dates. Doesn't require processes to reverse the trend of longer and longer best consumed by dates. Isn't that right? I, I don't, I really don't know, you know okay, on that. Right. And well, I don't the, know the what correct, the correct answer in this case was yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank our witnesses again for uh, for being here. Let me just uh, pick up where the chairman was. Um, uh, Mr. Taylor, you, you said you didn't know the, the 15 to 17 days, and then uh, what what a few years ago was five to 10 days. Um, is, is that that you personally don't know, or is that something that the USDA does not track and does not have any knowledge of? Well, I'm, I'm with the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and I, I definitely oh, the FDA, excuse me. I, pers I don't personally know. I, I'm, I'm confident that our experts, uh, you know, technical experts, could, would have that information, and we can certainly share what knowledge we've got with you for sure. Okay, well, but, but is it, well, I guess, well, Ms. Pegg, is, is that, uh, would, you, would you say that uh, the chairman's statement was, was accurate? That's, that's in fact been what's happened over the last several years, that da that date has went from 5 to 10 to 15 to 17? You know, I, I remember a lot of discussion about this in 2006 when the outbreak occurred, but I, I don't know what the guidance is or uh, where the trends have gone. So we're I don't going, have any information on that right now. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, we're, we're going to have votes here in a few minutes, and one of the bills we're going to be voting on is Mr. Dingle's uh, legislation. At least it looks like that. Um, give me your thoughts on that piece of legislation, because I know many in the agriculture community are concerned about that. Ms. Pegg, I think you and your in your introduction, uh, at least to the chairman, have a background with uh, mm -hmm. the California Farm Bureau. So let's start with you. Your thoughts on that bill that looks like it's going to be on the floor um, here in just a few minutes. Well, the bill clearly we support. Um, we do support the bill, and we, we look for um, looking at what the working group produces and looking at other, as they review current statutes mm -hmm. and regulatory authorities and seeing how we can move into the 21st century. I think what many of these measures... Let me ask you specifically about some of the concerns we've, mm -hmm. we've heard from uh, folks in agriculture. Uh, I got a long email last yeah. night. <laughs> um, 
and in particular uh, your former employer, the, the Farm Bureau. Do you think uh, do you think they're way off base, or do you think they, you know, again, recognizing where where you uh, worked before, do you think they got some valid valid concerns? You know, I I think that we have to. I think in working with FDA and USDA, we have a good partnership where we can both educate one another about what happens in the field, and they can assist us in giving us guidance on food safety practices. So I think it's a good partnership. That's why I personally am not, mm -hmm. um, do not necessarily share the concerns of my former employers. Mr. Taylor, would you like to comment on that bill? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the core strength of this bill is that it would um, have Congress mandate uh, the shift to a prevention strategy and empower FDA to set and enforce standards for preventive controls that will make food safer throughout mm -hmm. the system. Uh, for produce, it would, of course, direct FDA to issue regulations uh, to establish enforceable preventive controls and, importantly, direct FDA to take into account the diversity of the grower community, to take into account environmental impacts. I mean, these are all factors that have to be considered in order to get it right in terms of, of you know, having an abundant, safe supply mm -hmm. of fresh produce, which is an important goal uh, that, that we all share. With respect to the the concerns of the agriculture community. I mean, we've looked at the bill really hard. I think the bill has evolved a lot. And in fact, now very much focuses FDA's authorities with respect to on-farm activity to those areas such as fresh produce, where there is going to be a, a science-based, sort of risk-based justification uh, for establishing standards. And so I think it's a fairly focused bill. Let me in ask terms just a practical question. The, 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 the family out there who, this time of year, sets up the sweet corn stand, um, makes you know, makes a few extra dollars for yeah. their family. T tell me the impact, the legislation on the floor today, or what we're talking about here in this hearing. Tell, tell me how, tell me how they, they might be impacted. Yeah. Well, it, it, in developing regulations like this for an industry that has that degree of diversity. And, and, and in my background, I yeah. remember dealing with this back at the state house. I mean, yeah. and it, it was an uproar when there were some, some changes in, in the state of Ohio on how we were going to address, um, truck farms or whatever the, the official title right. they're given in the Ohio Revised Code. And we heard from mom and pop yeah. produce uh, uh, businesses all over the, uh, all over the yeah. state. So give yeah, me your so, thoughts. So business, our, our activities like that, I mean, are, it's very hard to envision how a federal regulation could establish a meaningful preventive control regime for an operation like that. And so again, taking the command of the bill seriously, we would look at where are the appropriate exemptions, how do you put the boundaries around these requirements so that we achieve the food safety objective but also do it in a feasible, realistic way. I mean, that's, that's the command we hope we get from Congress, and we plan to do that. Ms. Peg? Well, I think he does bring up a lot that you have to take into, consider, into consideration what happens on uh, different scales. And I think we'll be working a lot with FDA on the implementation of it and providing our experience and our guidance up there in that area. So. Okay. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go to a uh, second round of questions, and it uh, should be a little bit shorter. We'll go to the next panel. Mr. Taylor, uh, if you stretch out that best consumed by date on ready to eat pro uh, produce, it's a benefit for the processor. It obviously facilitates long distance transportation. Right. You know, instead of five to 10 days, 15 to 17 days, best used by. But isn't a shorter best consumed by period in the interest of protecting the public's health? Mr. Taylor. Well, uh, again, the, the question is uh, what what are the holding conditions for that product? What's the nature of the product? And I think you, you've got to have a scientific answer to that question. And there's no question that if you have pathogen growth potential and you're not having cold chain sort of safe handling practices, then you, the longer you hold the, the product, the, the greater the risk. And so I think we need a science-based answer to what, what's right there. Well, let's look at, let's look at a science-based case. In the case of the 2006 E. coli 157 outbreak that affected at least 204 people, has the FDA correlated 
the location and date of the consumption of the tainted spinach and the date of illness with the date of harvesting. Yeah. Okay. Harvested, best used by 204 people with E. coli. Yeah. You done the correlations? Again, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I started four weeks ago. I can find out what investigation was done, and we can brief you on and give you an answer later. Well, well let me, okay, well, then, since you don't know the answer, Fair question. you started four weeks ago, and lovely to have you here. <laughs> Will the FDA submit in writing to this committee for inclusion in the record a spreadsheet with that information for each of the known victims of E. coli 157 poisoning, namely, the location and date of consumption of the tainted products, the date of illness, and the original date of processing. Can you do that? We will provide you the information we have, and we'll... Uh, if, you we'll could, if you could do that, uh, we'd really appreciate that. And, and as a matter of fact, while we're at it, can you do that for all produce-related outbreaks since 1999? You know which ones they are. We've talked about a few of them. Yeah. Just create a spreadsheet. Shouldn't take too long to do, since you already have the information. Put it in a usable form for this committee so that we can, uh, it can help us in our deliberations about this issue of the transportation time and the best use by date, which so many consumers use as guidelines as to whether or not to consume something. Uh, for the uh, one... Uh, final question for each of the witnesses. Mr. Taylor again. Given CALGMA's purpose to protect public health by, redu health by reducing uh, microbial contamination in leafy greens, quote, from field to fork distribution supply chain, unquote, wouldn't it be more consistent with the purpose of CALGMA to include science-based restrictions on the packaging, distribution, and marketing practices of ready-to-eat produce rather than CALGMA's current near silence or lack of specific requirements on those issues? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I can't speak to the scope of, of the permissible scope of marketing agreements at USDA, but the answer to whether we need standards at each of those stages along the way that are enforceable and set by the Food and Drug Administration, the answer is clearly yes. Science-based. Yes, sir. And I, Ms. Pegg. Just, just to differentiate, too, the California marketing agreement is based on the California Marketing Act. We're looking at a national program, and I think that through this process as well as the public process, we can ensure that a final program does include all those components. Well, I, I want to, uh, before we conclude this, I'd like to uh, go back to Mr. Taylor. I want to read you a few opinions about the effect of the packaging used to market ready-to-eat produce. This is a quote. Because of the higher relative humidity of ready-to-eat packages. The risk of pathogenic growth is higher. Each degree over 40 degrees will increase the rate of pathogenic growth. This is from uh, Larry Boucher, PhD, Center for Food Safety, University of Georgia. Here's another quote. The problem comes when leafy greens are coming home in ready-to-eat bags. If they're left anywhere, when temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it's widely known they can become breeding grounds for bacteria, unquote. Uh, Mr. R. Atwell, Ph.D., Western Institute for Food Safety and Security. Uh, another quote, it's a perfect environment for all kinds of things to grow, unquote. Elisa Odabashian, West Coast Director, Consumer Union, Publisher of Consumer Reports. Mr. Taylor, isn't it true that all confirmed incidents of E. coli outbreaks since uh, 157 outbreaks since 1999 uh, have been caused by pre-cut packaged greens? As far as I know, and the only qualification is because I am under oath and just don't want to uh, misstate. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan. Do you want to take five minutes? I'll, I'll be brief. Just take a quick question on the, uh, on the bill again that's going to be on the floor here in a few minutes. Um, the, the, according to what we've looked at in the bill, uh, this gives the FDA pretty broad authority to regulate how crops are raised. I mean, in, in, in effect, 
and I'll be anxious to hear, I know we have a, a farmer on the, um, on the next panel, uh, in effect dictating how farmers produce their crop. Is, is that your understanding of how the, the legislation is going to work? There's no sort of broad uh, authority for FDA to tell farmers how to grow their crops. There's very specific authority that if we, we, based on science, can identify a commodity that poses risks that can be addressed through preventive uh, control measures, uh, such as the industry itself is, is, is implementing, then we are empowered in that specific case to establish enforceable standards, but it's not a broad uh, preventive control no, think, mandate. Think, it seems to me, though, as, as the chairman went to great lengths to point out, and I think appropriately so, that the problem doesn't see, seem to be with the farmer producing the crop. It seems to be elsewhere in the, in the supply chain, elsewhere in the processing or transportation or, or what have you, um, not with you know, that, that's my concern is that the, the farmer knows how to produce his crop. Let's, let's not overregulate, overburden this guy who's, who's producing the food. Yeah. Let's certainly not go out there and, and make it difficult for the mom and, uh, mom and pop who are uh, setting up the wagon and, and selling right. sweet corn to the neighbors and to the, to the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but we just know how government works. I mean, look, uh, we were told uh, last year that we're going to just have one small little bailout. We promise it'll just be one little bailout. Uh, and this thing won't grow, and, and you know, we, we don't want to get in the private sector. Like, and what we've seen what's happened over the last year, just in the, in the financial industry alone, let, and let alone the auto industry. So uh, these always start out with great intentions, but we know the pattern of government and what, what typically happens. So uh, that's my concern. I think, frankly, it's in, in a large degree the chairman's concern. And certainly, lots of folks in agriculture, they're concerned because they just know the nature of government. Uh, it's, it's tough enough many times for folks in agriculture to deal with the State Department of Agriculture and other regulatory agencies at the state level, let alone now Big Brother in, in, in Washington uh, tell them how to run their farm, how to run their business. So that's my big concern, and um, we'll continue to watch this whole process relative to the bill and, and the issue we're, we're, we're addressing here in the committee. And with that, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're going to go to one, uh, one more round here uh, before we get to the next panel. Uh, Ms. Pegg, here's another example of something farmers have a problem with. CALGMA identifies a number of sources of potential pathogens that must be avoided for certification. These include birds, feral pigs, and other wildlife, as well as cattle. To comply, farmers are paying for measures, such as the building of large fences to thwart wildlife. But the science hardly conclusive, Ms. Pegg. The wildlife was a likely source of contamination. Uh, let me go over that again. The science is hardly conclusive that wildlife was mm -hmm. a likely source of contamination in the 2006 spinach contamination. Isn't that so? Well, in the 2006, actually in the outbreak, there was, and maybe FDA can speak to this, but there was concern about wildlife in that outbreak that did occur. Um, wild pigs was, was the wildlife in question. Are you saying, are, are you saying there was concern? Is that evidence-based? Is it... Uh, or is it conjectural? What, what's the basis of that concern? And was it conclusive or was it conjectural or was it, was it science-based? What was it? Um, I, well, maybe you can speak to the investigation, but I, if you've been to the Salinas Valley and that region. I've been to Salinas Valley. Okay. There is um, that area, there is known some wildlife activity. Now, the California Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement does look at other potential risks, and they also do rank wildlife as high risk or low risk. I would like to, I, I would, in order to facilitate this hearing, I'd, I'd like you to supply to this committee the information about the, ba the basis of your statement uh, that wildlife was somehow connected with this. I'd like to see some scientific uh, backup of that, okay? Would okay, you, I thanks. will get it for the now for the 2006. Two, right, exactly. Now outbreak. Um, a leafy greens, Ms. Pegg, a leafy green field's proximity to cattle is a high risk circumstance for E. coli contamination. Does Calgma make distinctions between high risk circumstances and lower risk circumstances, such as the presence of frogs or other wildlife? Does Calgma prioritize, in other words, high risk circumstances while deprioritizing low risk circumstances? I believe it does. And isn't it true that all farms have to eliminate riparian areas, hedgerows, if they're within a calgma specified distance from a crop edge? I'm not, I'm not positive on okay. the current Ms. best Pegg, practices I want you to look that. at this slide on the screen. Did staff put the slide up? 
Okay. The aerial photo above was taken before Calgma. You can plainly see a strip of green between several fields where trees and hedges are and where birds and wildlife can take shelter. Now look at the aerial photo below taken after Calgma. Here you can plainly see that the strip of trees and hedges has been eliminated. No wildlife there. Now isn't it true, Ms. Pegg, that Calgma would have required the cutting down of those trees? I, I don't know if I can speak to that because I don't know if they're Calgma okay, participants now, or if they're buyers which has been one of, I mean, this has been a huge issue. We have discussed this since 2006, is that how do you deal with, um, are there real risks or not? And I was talking to California Fish and Game this week about it. It's, well, a, it's well, a big you're, issue. You're the nation's advocate for farmers. Does it make sense for the USDA to advocate for a processor-based framework that requires all farmers to spend heavily to prevent low-risk events, such as contamination by wildlife, while well, the higher risk but rarer circumstance of proximity to cattle and a known risk associated with processing and packaging leafy grains are more significant contributors to the problems CALGMA intends to address. Any program needs to address the risks and look at high risks versus low risks. I think what we're, we're looking at in terms of any program is looking at all chains in the process and how to reduce the risks. So who should pay for compliance with CALGMA? The farmer? The processing industry? Should the cost be shared? Under the marketing agreement, I believe they propose a per carton assessment that the handler pays to cover the cost of the marketing agreement. So who currently pays for the measures adopted to comply with CALGMA? I think for the California Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, that's a per carton assessment that pays for it. Farmers? Uh, well, they're handler signatories, so handlers pay it. Farmers. Okay, I think, we're, uh, I think we're completed with questioning of the first panel. We will be in touch with you regarding the follow-up on questions that we've asked, and we appreciate your cooperation with the committee and your presence here today. Those buzzers that you heard are... Um, the reason why I'm going to have to recess this meeting until after votes. How many votes do we have? Uh, there are three votes, and so I'd like to take a, a half hour break. And then we're going to come back with a second panel, and we'll take testimony from uh, those who are here to talk about their experience. I want to thank the uh, representatives of the FDA and the USDA for being here. Uh, we look forward to working with you on these issues so that we can help uh, the consumers across America have uh, co more confidence mm -hmm. in the safety of our uh, leafy green packaged foods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. And, Chairman. Uh, the committee stands in recess for a half hour. We're going to vote. Be back uh, in about a half hour. <laughs>